Uh, in terms of how many canals should you actually go ahead and treat in one uh, treatment session, uh, I think it's, uh, when you look at different clinics, uh, it's quite uh, different from clinic to clinic what they actually recommend. But in, in my opinion, I think there should be a limit of about two canals at a time. Uh, I usually, I prefer just to treat one canal, but if I get the very common combination of uh, deep side lateral uh, posterior and lateral BPPV, I go ahead and treat those two canals at the same time with a potentiated maneuver, and that works very fine. But I think it's um, it's a bit risky to do treatments of more than two canals. But I know, especially guys like uh, Mr. Vitong, he he's actually able to to treat five out of six canals in one treatment session. Um, for the multi-canal BPPV patients, I recommend that you actually go ahead and treat the canals where patients are uh, most severely affected. And that would usually be the canals where they are most symptomatic. Um, if you have a case history of a typical BPPV, then you would uh, find that when you do your eye monitoring and your eye measurements, you will see that if you look at the slow phase velocities, they are proportional to the amount of uh, symptoms that the patients actually uh, complain about. So you can either you know, decide depending on uh, where is the canal where the patient is very symptomatic, or you can actually also use the parameter of the uh, slow phase velocities and determine what side to treat first. The augmented maneuver with uh, the TRV chair, uh, to be honest, I, I do not know at the moment uh, if it provides anything extra to the treatment. I can tell you in general that uh, the TRV chair treatment is very efficient, especially for the complex cases and also for the very retractable cases. But um, we did a study that looked at only the posterior BPPV patients, and we were actually not able to find any significant difference between uh, an Ibley maneuver done with uh, the TRV chair and the potentiated Ibley done with the TRV chair. So at the moment, we don't know for sure, but, uh, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's my clinical experience that it works. Um, and I'm uh, convinced that if you especially focus on the subtype of tubule lithiasis, I would have, uh, I would expect that the potentiated maneuvers uh, would be superior to the maneuvers done without any uh, kinetic forces applied also. Um, no one actually knows the optimal number of shocks being uh, applied when you do the augmented maneuvers with the TRV chair. But uh, at my clinic, we've always used uh, 10 shocks in every position, and that was what I learned from Mr. Vuitton a long time ago. I know sometimes he uses 12 now in every position, and I also know one of the clinics uh, in a different, uh, at a different university hospital in Denmark, they use only three uh, shocks in every position. So to be honest, I don't know, but uh, that, that would be very interesting to look into if you uh, do it more like a, a clinical trial uh, setting where you can actually say, okay, this patient is randomized for a certain amount of treatments and then compare with other uh, numbers and see what actually works the best. So it's always a compromise. Of course, you want to treat the patient, but you don't want to you know, over treat the patient. So you might uh, risk dislodging uh, additional otoconium maybe from the uh, control level side. Uh, I do believe there is a risk that you can dislodge uh, otoconia uh, with especially the augmented maneuvers in the TRV chair. Um, to what extent is actually very hard to say because no one really knows. Um, in my experience, uh, I have seen uh, especially uh, contralateral BPPV during follow-up, uh, following successful treatments. And if that's because of uh, the treatment offered or 
if it's because people are predisposed, uh, that's very hard to say. Uh, we did a study uh, a few years ago where we looked at overall treatment uh, success rates. And we, as I told earlier, we found it, uh, the chair to be very efficient in the treatment. But we actually also saw that about 20% either had uh, dislodged uh, otoconia uh, on the contralateral side at the follow-ups or uh, also uh, ipsilaterally, they also had uh, new uh, BPPV during the follow-up period. Uh, if you look at the possibility of dislodging uh, otoconia during the treatments, um, in my opinion, it should not limit uh, your usage of the TRE chair because if you are able to, you might be able to dislodge uh, otoconia with the treatment offered. But uh, I think if you weigh ups and downs and pros and cons, then then uh, I think what you can actually get with the chair, both in diagnostics and treatment. Uh, outnumbers, you know, the, the risk of uh, of dislodging any additional autoconia. The, the people we see here at our Tudio Distance Center, they are uh, many of them predisposed of loosening their uh, otoliths. So, uh, of course, uh, some of them they are going to experience, you know, maybe contralateral BPPV in, after we've treated something successful. But uh, what I always tell my patient is that if I can dislodge anything, then uh, I do believe that they are actually able to do that themselves and just doing their you know, daily living, daily uh, activities. Uh, so if they can loosen the odor list, I can also do that and vice versa. So I don't, I don't see it as a major problem because they are, of course, these patients, they are predisposed in some way. Are there actually any patients where I would recommend not using the chair? Uh, in my opinion, it's very limited that uh, in terms of numbers because there are so many patients out there and almost all of them, they can actually be put into the chair, both for diagnostics and treatment. But there is a limit to the amount of kilos that you can actually uh, use the chair for. So if you have a patient that exceeds 150 kilos, that's not recommendable. And also if they've had a cerebral hemorrhage or also if they're known with any cerebral aneurysms, that would also be a contraindication for usage of the TRV chair.